So I have 27 slides in 20 minutes. Uh, and those of you who know me know that that's not a problem for me. It might be a problem for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see if I can do this by 1407. It might be 1409. So my name is Kurt Thinkvist. I work for NetNode in Stockholm. Uh, we run the exchange point there. We also run one of the 30 root servers just like Ripe do. And we also anycast some uh, well, in the cast 30 countries, and we do the slave service from 60 countries, uh, and also the Apex reverse service. Uh, and if you do see us in any of the exchanges we're at, we're at around 40 locations worldwide, please pray with us. Uh, we'll see you afterwards. I won't be here tonight, I'm leaving after this. Uh, I'm going to talk about critical infrastructure protection in the EU, uh, in the EC actually. Uh, but first, I also promised to talk a bit about EuroX, which I happen to be the current chairman of. Uh, so what's EuroX then? This is Europe, in case you haven't wondered, time to wake up. Yeah. Uh, and um, all the blue dots are exchange points who are members of EuroX, and the red ones are, as Sir said, soon to be affiliated. Uh, and Europe is actually one, or if not the most exchange dense region in the world. And the interesting thing is that this will have some so the impact on the discussion of critical infrastructure protection too. Uh, EuroX is the association of exchange points that was formed in, in 2001. Uh, it came from, at the right meetings, there's always been something called the EIX working group, where the exchange points tend to interact with the operators, but the exchange points also felt that it was enough to discuss to have our own separate meetings and forums uh, discussions to have this. And, and to help share information and to help share uh, knowledge and, and ideas around this. Uh, and as of 2005, we also actually have members that are non-European. We allow for, for exchange point members from all around the world to join EuroX. And, and that's what happened too. There's currently 59 affiliated IXPs. Uh, 47 of them are from Europe in 27 countries. Um, some of these IXs actually operate more IXPs than one, like NetNode having changes in five cities in Sweden, but we're only one organization. Uh, and DPIX have the same in a few others. There's 12 exchange points from the rest of the world, and it includes Asia, South America, uh, Africa. And we have 11 affiliated, what we call patrons. These are organizations who are not exchange points, but they provide services or, or have relationship with exchange points that are interested. It's all the switch vendors, the colos, uh, and, and some of the DVDM equipment vendors that the exchange points use as well. Uh, we have twice a year, we have a two day forum uh, where we tend to have a bit different topics, technical issues, commercial issues, regulatory updates, and uh, also presentations from outside the community. And we also have what we call virtual working groups, which is what you would know as mailing lists, <laughs> uh, which is discussing some of these topics and, and working on it as well. The Eurex Secretariat also tend to go to meetings around the world and, and try to bring in new experts, but also present Eurex. And you'll see in a bit that Eurex also does all the statistics and try to promote the exchange points and peering and the value adds. We also have a, re a part time regulatory officer that m monitors what happens in the regulatory scope, uh, especially inside the European Commission, uh, but also around the, around the rest of the world, and provide that as a, as a well, news service, if you want, to the, the member ISPs. Uh, and we have a website with some tools and I'll talk to that in a So, uh, the other services we do, most of these services are of course only interesting to exchange points, like the Benchmarking Club. The Benchmarking Club is a, a facility where all the membership ISPs will provide a lot of data from pricing, staff salaries, numbers of staff, etc., into an anonymous to the Secretariat, where the Secretariat will, will make them anonymous towards us. But you actually get a benchmarking in, a, in a, quite a few a number of areas of how your ISP compares to all the other ones. Uh, but you don't see you provide the data, you can't see, I can only see my data. Uh, but we also have a number of services that are, are made for the operators. Um, the switch to DB and, uh, and run server DB is again maybe more internal test which exchange point is using what switches, what software versions, and what run server and what software versions. And we also get exchange staff, etc. 
There is more tools that are available uh, that, is, that you can see, for example, how many exchanges have what members, how many unique members do they have, from which parts of the world do those members come, etc. And you can use a lot of these tool set to go see where it makes sense for you to peer and what, uh, what would be interesting for you to peer at. Uh, and we have around 60 ISPs from around the world that also provide data to this. Eurex was a tremendous success, much larger success than anyone else could think when he started. And other parts of the world have started to think that they want to have their own exchange fund association. And we have one in, in, in Latin America called NAPLA, there is one in, in, uh, in Asia, uh, whose name is case by the moment. Uh, and we decided to, that e all these organizations will cooperate and share uh, the, the tool sets that we use and we develop the URX between them and we help everybody run this together. So, as I said, one of the things that URX does is to go around the world and promote some <coughs> of the data. Now, I'm gonna give you the data of Europe. We actually have data for other parts as well. Most of this is for Europe. This is a 12 month traffic graph traffic growth as the exchange point in Europe, um, which is actually quite tremendous. A 44% increase in, in 12 months from April to April, and it's even more actually if you look at these false numbers. Uh, so traffic over the exchange points are growing. This is of course because new, new members join, but traffic is shifting to the exchange points and away from, from other means of exchanging traffic, which, which is good. The number of ISPs in Europe are also growing. The blue line is the no total number of exchange points in Europe, and the red one is not the amount of new ISPs being formed. And you can see that in 2001 and 2003, most of the exchange points that we had were formed. One third of all of them were, were created in those years, uh, even to this day. We still see new ones being built. And here is the numbers that have 6,000 ISP, um, uh, ISPs peering at 127 ISPs in Europe, with around 3,300. 2,400 unique AS numbers. Of these, an astonishing number of 1,000 ASs are present at more than one IAS. That's quite a quite lot, actually. Uh, and we have, on average, one gig of traffic per member throughout Europe. If you look at the estimates, this is actually done not just by the EUREX data, but by collected known data. Europe, we have 6,000 participants. Um, and um, Asia and North America. The number, I know this is a big webcast, so I don't know who's going to listen, but I'll say it anyway. The thing that astonishes me with this number is that Europe by outranks all the other regions of the world when it comes to peering and exchanges. There's no other region who has been this successful. If you travel a bit, you'll notice that all the people who are trying to tell other countries how to build exchanges, none of them are European. <laughs> uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusion for that word. Um, but anyway, it's clear that, that Europe is much more successful than, for example, North America or Asia, by far. The ISPs that are uh, present at most of the European exchange points, Akamai, the CDN, tend to be in Google, uh, are, are quite high up. Uh, and then we have some of the, the other, uh, and then we actually start seeing uh, ISPs who, who join these exchange points. 43 operators are more than 10 exchanges in Europe. That's quite a bit, actually. Quite a few news. Uh, and globally, Google then tends to be at Akamai, followed by Lime Line. They have all the CDNs there. And then they have Hurricane Electric, actually. There you go. Yay, and they have all And um, we should do one of these IP6 I, I lists, too, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and then we continue with more CDNs, Microsoft, Yahoo, et cetera. Those are. There wasn't any sure. The growth of new participants in Europe, this again for Europe, is slowing. Uh, but it's still growing. It's not this, so this is the, the amount of growth, not the number, but the absolute numbers. But we're still seeing growth. Uh, if you look at other parts of the world, we're seeing a much stronger growth. We're seeing much more ISPs being formed. Many of the, the other parts of the world, like Africa, are roughly where we were in Europe in 1999, for example. And there are still exchange points being built, they're seeing deregulation of the markets, and, uh, and they're seeing the opening up of, of peering. And surprise, as, a, as an effect of this, they're also seeing cost of transit prices dropping, and the cost of end user prices dropping, which we all knew all over. 
if we extrapolate based on the current traffic growth for exchange points, we actually get a bit of an interesting uh, growth here. Um, in five years, we'll have passed 45, 47 terabits. That's quite a bit of, quite a bit of growth. That's a tremendous growth. Um, I, we have some meetings. What's starting to happen is that some of the big exchanges have pushed quite hard in standardization for development of a 100 gig standard when all the server vendors are about to hijack and said we only need 40. And uh, there is actually some exchange that are not trying to push some of the vendors to understand that the 100 gig is too late. We should not be talking about the step after the 100 gig. We are, because the standards, and not to mention the vendors, will take at least 10 years before they have something that we can use. And in 10 years from now, 100 gig won't scale. This is growing much, much faster than anything you see. And if you talk to, I, I, I'm on the list of the people looking at the next generation after 100 gig, and there is some incredible short-sightedness on that list. Uh, you, you can tell real numbers and graphs and give it to them, and they won't read it. They just won't read it. You can, I don't know, anyway. uh, there was a guy from one of, the, one of the largest transaction places in the world, which is one of the stock exchanges, and they actually shared the number of simultaneous transactions that they pass per second. And the vendors didn't believe it. Anyway. Um, so, uh, peering scene in 2015, this is done by search. We'll probably have a few more exchanges in Europe. Uh, we'll probably have even more members. Uh, we are seeing a lot of new type of members join. Uh, we'll see more AS numbers. 52 terabits compared to 6.3 we have today. Uh, peak traffic of 360 gig uh, on average. And uh, probably I have around 55 more, more members, uh, uh, average members. So we don't see so much growth in members, but we do see growth in traffic a lot. That was all I had on EuroX. Any questions on that? No? Well, we have 10 minutes for the rest of it. Good. Have you all followed me, or was that too fast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so critical infrastructure protection. So the European Commission has something called uh, Critical Infrastructure Directive, which outlines how we protect critical infrastructure in Europe. Uh, and they have had a lot of work done on, on power lines and water and God knows what. Uh, and uh, they have decided, or they haven't decided, they have a, a internet that they want to include uh, telecommunications in the same framework. Uh, and that's what they say with all the words here. And to do this, they want to de decide what type of infrastructure, how do we define this? Uh, infrastructure, uh, and what they haven't said, which, which for me as an operational background is, is <laughs> uh, hard, hard to grasp, but they haven't actually said what this means. So they say they want to identify the critical infrastructure. Well, good, we have a list. Um, they are very quiet when you ask them what their plans are. They said, no, 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 we should first identify it. Anyway. Um, and there's also a European, uh, so this EPC CIP is this, this overall uh, critical infrastructure protection that we work on. Um, to do this, uh, they have created this EP3R program, which is a private public partnership, uh, which is uh, a lot of words for saying that the industry is welcome to vent their views to the Commission and they have a right to ignore it. Uh, and, uh, but the good thing is that they have actually inv invited all uh, telcos, most of the telcos, uh, most of the telcos lobbyists in Brussels actually. Uh, the good news is that I've been there since the beginning. The participants in that group has changed, and a lot of the large carriers now actually send their operational staff. Uh, and and the, uh, the willingness to agree with the Commission has also changed a bit, let's put that way. Um, they, the, the commission did a study and they said, that, look, we want to include telecommunication. And so far, I think everybody agrees, telecommunication today is a very critical part of what we do. And there probably is things that you can, you can include in this. Um, I don't know how much you follow EC politics, but there's also a bit of a different dimension here is that this is what the EC wants. That doesn't necessarily mean that all member states think this is a good idea. And traditionally, 
because telecommunications is a bilateral concern between the member states when it crosses the border, it has so far only been handled by the member states uh, on these, these bilateral agreements on how, how to protect sea cables and, and cable assets. Also, there is an almost identical program being run by NATO. So the member states are NATO countries are a bit less interested to work inside the Commission. Um, that said, uh, what the Commissioner said is that today a telecommunication link crossing uh, a border might have, have consequences and dependencies from, from member states very much further away. For example, I guess most of the Finnish traffic today actually crosses through the, the, the uh, bridge Copenhagen Malmo, so you could say that is a link that is that can't be considered just a concern of those two member states, but it also concerns a lot of other member states. And, uh, and so on, and we are the same in, in Central Europe and to the south, in Greece, if anyone knows what. Um, so there is there's all this complexity of how do we, who has responsibility for protecting this, and how should we coordinate in the case there's a failure. So they said there's five areas. One is the preparedness and prevention, and this is a task that goes towards member states that they should have for their own responsibility. They should be prepared to, to react when there is a fault, and they should be able to prevent this. Detection and response, mitigation and recovery, internal, uh, international cooperation, uh, and this criteria is almost being sort of worked outside of this EPTR working group on content. So the EPTR working group is actually open to anyone who's interested to join. If you feel you have enough <laughs> time to go to Brussels every second month, every month, and spend between three and one days, uh, then you, you should. There's a website. If you Google EP3R and get to the website, there's lots of documents and so on, etc. The EP3R is split into three working groups. Um, they all have, have position papers that are unfortunately not to be shared outside the group, so I can't really tell you what the current yeah. thinking is. Um, but I'll, I'll, well, anyway, uh, let, let's pretend I'm not telling you anything what's going on in this working group. So the first working group is in a, has the task of coming up with what's the criteria for something to become critical on a European scale. Now, that's a good, that's a, it's a good ambition, eh? but in reality, of course, networks are very, very complex, and you start explaining to them that oh, but a single link might have pseudo wires. We don't know what's going on. We don't. The owner of the cable system might not actually know how much traffic or what traffic or where it goes that crosses this link. You tell this to the commission, and they go, "Don't tell us." We we could abstract that away. Um, well, doesn't really quite work that way. We had a long discussion about the DNS system, for example. They wanted to include only the root service and .eu. And I explained to them, I don't, I don't really think that's quite how the DNS works. And, and you know, each of the member state TLDs in a free market actually quite important too. And I said, yeah, but we've got to abstract it away because the member states doesn't like it, we regulate them. So yeah, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so there is, I mean, I, I, I have respect for this. It's very hard to make some sort of criteria or recommendation, but that might mean that you, know, you can't just abstract away complex problems. Working group two here is tasked with what, once we define what's critical, which we haven't, by the way, um, they are supposed to say, what's the, the minimum criteria you have to meet? What's the minimum level? Now, you have to understand that these two working groups are working in parallel with no crossover intersection, right? Doesn't work too well. Um, Working group three actually does something that is actually quite good though. They are looking at how do we actually share and cooperate information in the case there is a major fault, and how do we prepare? Because some member states do run cyber exercises. So in Sweden, for example, we do run exercises every year, uh, or every second year, uh, where all the telecos are put in front of a, a failure that is as well, a cascading series of events that will affect all of us. And we have to, we have to try and respond to this. In a, in, a, in a exercise. It's actually really, really good. It, it, you, you, the people who do this exercise, it put you into questions and put you into stress. It's quite interesting. We did this last time. Uh, we did it during a right meeting. And a lot of me, also including me, was in, in, in Amsterdam. And uh, they, they do all kind of very interesting stress tests towards your organization. One thing to do is, because I'm the CEO, they wanted to see how you react under pressure. And they had a journalist call me every five minutes for an hour. And these are real journalists, and they, they won't let you go because there's a fictive story going on, right? And they, it's really, you really have to think hard to, and they, they'll judge you afterwards and say that this guy just gave you absolute rubbish answers. 
But it's, it's, it's interesting, and the, the Duke test is also on the technical knowledge and the communication stuff. It's a, it's a really good exercise to do. So working group three is working at what of this has been done in Europe, what can we copy, what can we share? And it's actually a fairly good exercise. I'm more worried about the first two. Um, if you wanted me to say anything, what's the outcome here? Honestly, I don't know. But the first, on, the, on these working groups, it, this has to be done by the end of the year. And we have one or two meetings left, and we have no results. Uh, well, sorry, there is a result. <laughs> there, is, there is a proposal. Uh, I'm not sure it's so good, to, but we'll see. Uh, I do think that if you work for of radio carriers, and you think, or you know that you have representation here, or if you know the people from Finland attending, please talk to them, please give them your feedback, because there's this going, I mean, we have a deadline, and uh, that deadline is not allowed to slip. The commission has said that very clearly. They're gonna present something by the end of the year, whether you like it or not. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, do you remember if uh, you have from physics exams? No. So there is actually the only exchange point attempt is me. Actually, originally there was only two people that had any operational background. It was me and the guy from BT. The rest were lobbyists. Um, there were 70 people in the first meeting. We were the only two operators. The rest were Microsoft, Intel, uh, BAE, Tails. Yeah, all defense companies. Uh, it has become better. So now there's a lot of people from France Telecom, BT. Uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom, etc. Uh, and then it's all the member states. So Finland is certainly represented. I think it's someone from Picora who goes up to you. So all the member states are represented. But uh, I don't think there's anyone from Tele or Tele has ever been there. Is. And, and I'm the only change point uh, who has gone there. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly worth, worth having a look. One thing, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So the other thing, uh, okay, can I actually yeah. come back to my uh, question? So uh, we have one person from Viestintera stuff, Picora. Uh, do you know who from Picora is? Uh, well, I have a good um, guess for that. I don't know personally where of the right person. Could be our one of our sick people or a few people from our network unit. Okay. I, I, I can look up for this. I have attended this, so I can look up for this, but I, I just don't remember. I guess you know um, then we also have an ESA. Uh, I actually haven't someone before, I've been having to watch my words a bit more, but um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, an ESA is a, is a very helpful uh, organization that has produced a lot of useful reports, uh, and their life ends on, uh, sorry, uh, the current extension is until March the 13th, 2012, uh, and depending on which member state you ask, the micro might not get continued. Uh, they have three, th three main tasks, collecting appropriate information. I, I, I love this, appropriate information. Well, I, please don't say this appropriate, anyway. Um, develop common methodologies uh, and doing enhanced cooperation among the member states and the search in Europe. So, ENISA does a lot of things. They also do work in DNSSEC. It's actually a fairly good reports in DNSSEC, and they have done really good reports in many cases. Uh, but to come back to critical infrastructure protection, and the exchange points, well, they conducted an exercise called Cyber Europe 2010 that was actually had nothing to do with critical infrastructure except that their PR department managed to span, uh, spin it in the press as an as exercise to coordinate and, and handle a cyber attack in Europe. From reading the re report, that wasn't quite true, and I talked to some of the NISA people, and yet their PR department got a bit out of hand. But what they have done is that they have produced a report called uh, Resilience of the Inter Interconnect Ecosystem. And this report, the full report is close to, I think, 300 pages. Uh, the executive summary is 30 pages. And uh, it's based on a number of interviews with operators and exchange points in Europe. Uh, and it, it, it's, uh, I think it's a good report to write. I do think it misses the point a bit, though. Uh, again, Europe is the most interconnected region in the world. A failure, even by one of the big major transit carriers, would actually work. When I worked at KP and Quest, we had a failure of, of uh, as you know, most of the transatlantic cable systems failed because we had a uh, after September 11th. But we still actually worked around that because we managed to have traffic in Europe we could pick up over links and M6. And, and all the carriers cooperated very quickly and we made this work. And this has happened in quite a few cases in, the, in afterwards when we had cable systems in the Mediterranean fail, etc. So we have tested this, it does work. But part of the problem is that it's not visible to ENISA and it's not visible to the European Commission. It is visible to many of the member states. And uh, 
If you go talk to NISA, they say, oh, this doesn't exist. There is, there is no cooperation when it comes to fighting cybercrime, viruses, etc. There is, but you don't part of it. Um, which, I guess we can have a long discussion about whether it's good or bad. There's also a problem, though, is that many of the European member states actually doesn't have CERTs, well, many. Some of them doesn't have, actually have CERTs. And it is uh, together with some of the CERTs are working on doing that. Well, you probably know more about than I do, but there is work being done to, to, to fill this gap. But back to the report, they identify, and I'm running over time, but back to the report, though, they are identifying some areas of further work. One is routing security and having something like RPKI deployed, which I think we'll hear more later, which is good. Uh, they talk about doing more of these cyber exercises. I fully agree with that. I think that's fairly uncontroversial. Uh, they want to do more independent investigations. Um, that that can be, or I mean, that might or might not be a good thing. Uh, you have to read this in the light that Enisa's mandate ends on March 13, right? Uh, and um, I think it's good if we can do more incident investigation, but if that's the only reason we're going to keep Enisa, maybe not. Uh, I'm a bit concerned we're trying to duplicate efforts for the poor operators who have to reply to this. They do pr propose, and that's a good thing, that we actually have to come up with a lot better measurements and uh, metrics for measuring uh, data resiliency, network resiliency. And that comes a bit back to the problem of EP3R is that we should maybe have done that first and then gone away and tried to do regulation. Because currently we have no idea what kind of mission. Uh, they also say that there's today very little incentives to build resilience into the networks, which is true. Uh, they also warn that there's a transit market failure coming up, which I actually agree with. I think that the CDN is proving that transit operators are basically going away because there's no traffic to transport anymore. They do say that one of the things they are very worried about is that operators start doing transit, this is my last slide, traffic prioritization. Uh, then in case of a crisis, who gets to decide what traffic is prioritized? And today's the carriers and they are hinting at that maybe member states or the commission wouldn't like what they decide to prioritize. I was in a hearing in Sweden where we pointed out to the government that in case it's a failure, the last thing we need to have working is parliament. Uh, they didn't quite ex agree, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. If there's a crisis, who, what, what on earth do we need the parliament for? Right? Except you know, we have an executive branch to deal with this. I don't need someone to vote. So. Anyway, they also propose last is a certification scheme where you can, if you meet certain cri uh, critical infrastructure uh, thresholds, you can get certificates. And maybe that would be one of the, the ways to make incentives for this. So there are actually quite a lot of this going on. A lot of this will come to an end before the end of the year. It's, to me at least, very unclear what the outcome will be. And there's a risk that the Commission will go away and write this by themselves. Uh, because they, they feel pressured by political will to have something done. Uh, and on the other side, we have reality that tells them that maybe there isn't something they can do. Uh, I think there's a very good intentions, and I understand why they want to do this. They don't want to be held responsible for something uh, that fails. Um, the outcome is, again, I keep asking myself, so if they identify this, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to regulate it? And if they do, who's going to pay for it? If they demand that all connections have to be redundant, who's going to pay for it? Well, I can bet you more money to the mission. And that was the last slide. And I'm here until six ish, something. Any questions? You're all very, very happy now, aren't you? Can you leave all the things a little bit slow? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can go back and watch the video in slow motion. It's probably much more sensitive.